Hello everyone, welcome back to Cisco Live 2023. Dave Vellante with John Furrier. We're wrapping up our second day. We've had all the execs on, the whole big theme around simplification. AI injected everywhere into Cisco's security cloud, their network cloud, their collaborative cloud. Cloud's everywhere, John. <laughs> Bob O'Donnell is here. He's the president and chief analyst of Technalysis Research, friend of theCUBE. Bob, good hey, to see you. Thanks, thanks for coming on. Hey, thanks on. for having me, guys. Thanks Appreciate it. Pleasure. Great yeah. to get you in, in So we missed you at MWC, because yes. you, you had, I think, COVID in the I family. COVID, Hope, like, hopefully you got literally. it. Okay, so. Yeah, literally. The, good, well, recovered. my wife got it, and then I got it. Yeah, yeah. Eight hours before the flight, I, I got a positive <laughs> test. I'm like, you've got Jim Gaffigan was how was hilarious today. Well, yeah. I got yeah. COVID. That was good. Yeah. But uh, anyway, uh, so welcome to the Cube. Yeah. Uh, we want to talk about Cisco at big Apple Developer Conference yep. this week. You I was participated. There. Yeah. So we want to get out. your angle there. Mm -hmm. Cisco somehow they really oh, yeah. won't say is involved. So yeah. we want to get you. He actually did make a statement. He did. Yeah. It was totally he did. clinical and couched. Well, I mean, almost look, like don't look here. Well, but the thing is, I will tell you, since you brought that up, just to quickly mention, during the keynote, Cisco and WebEx logos came up twice, right? So, uh, and then, during this the, is the Apple, the, Apple the Apple keynote. Now, there were Zoom and yeah. Teams logos too, but the point was, they said, look, we're going to bring these collaborative applications to Vision Pro. And then, of course, we heard G2 this morning in the day two keynote say, we're going to have WebEx on Vision Pro. And that's about all they said, but they did say it. And then yesterday they also talked about the fact that for um, uh, one of their services, and now I'm spacing on the name, they're going to have essentially no Apple client required. It's going to be all on the back end, but you'll be able to get access to their smart, to, it's the, it's the uh, service that allows you to basically run an app and it knows do I have to go over a VPN or is it a SaaS app or do whatever I need to do. For most machines, you're going to have to install a client, but for all the Apple stuff, they figured out a mechanism to do that in the back end, so you don't have to do anything. So clearly, the only way that kind of stuff works is if there's some deep collaboration between Apple and Cisco. So they they see it as an opportunity. Now, how many Vision Pros are going to actually sell? So it'll matter. That's a whole separate question. We can get to in a but second. But what's notable well, though is that the device itself looks like a ski goggle, still kind of better form factor than the the big bulky headset. But it's the display technology, some of the the tech behind Cisco telepresence. There's a lot of stuff going on that's not just. I mean, WebEx. I was being polite to G2. I think the name should be changed, but. But, but it's, it's not just WebEx anymore, there's a lot under the covers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And people, I think, misunderstand that, right? People think, oh, WebEx and Zoom and Teams, why does Cisco even bother? But right. collaboration is so much, so much more. We saw that today. What'd you think of that demo that G2 gave? Uh, it, the telepresence, the whole, you know, the conference room. Yeah. Uh, uh, is that unique? In the industry, it's, it is absolutely unique. But I look, we're we're doing video. We know how video works. Mm -hmm. Like you don't just magically get shots, you know, from different places without like six cameras in that room. Yeah, yeah. And so I keep and 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 I saw that demo. I had been pre-briefed on it before, and I raised that question to them. And I'm like, guys, like, the how games. are you going to do that? <laughs> we right? said the same thing, like NFL replays. Yeah, it's like yeah. you. Could, I mean, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and those NFL replays, they got like eight gazillion cameras. And anyway, but obviously conceptually, very cool. Yeah, right? working at home, you're not going to have three robo games that no, cost eight grand. No, you're not. A you're, piece. I mean, you're not, and you're not even going to have that in most conference rooms. But but I, look, the fundamental thing that they're trying to achieve, which is to break down the serious problem that everybody's having now, which is, you know, if there's six Hollywood squares and then the room. That's a horrible experience, Terrible. right? Yeah. It was great during the pandemic when there were nine Hollywood squares or 12 or even a thousand, whatever, but not a thousand, but you know what I mean. Um, but as soon as you start to do that combination of the Hollywood squares and then the room, it's like, oh man, I can't hear the room. I, I can't see who's talking in the room. It's yeah. Terrible experience. It's a, so is it? What's the play there then? Is it just sort of demonstration of innovation, or is it actually you think a real it, business? It, no, it's it's, it's, it's demonstration of innovation um, because obviously what they're now starting to do is they've got a higher resolution camera to start with, so they can put a 4K camera in, and then they can split it up, you know, intelligently. So they've got some AI stuff in the background figuring this out, uh, how to split up the view so that they can concentrate on the act activity so that um, you know, they still have a reasonable amount of resolution. It's sort of like, 
you know, there's this idea of foveated rendering in a headset where depending on where you're looking, you know, you get higher resolution. I'm guessing there's some sort of the inverse of that with these cameras where they're looking at it and wherever they see there's action, they're focusing a little bit more of the resolution there um, to do this. So, now I will say it was interesting. Uh, I had They had a breakfast meeting uh, for analysts and some of their clients and I asked uh, this gentleman from, he was a financial firm, um, and I said, hey, you know, what about capabilities like this? Because I've been intrigued by this ever since Cisco first showed this. He's like, you know, people like it, but it's like, yeah, whatever. I mean, so, <laughs> I don't know. It's like, sometimes you, I get obsessed with it as an analyst and as a technologist to go, that's so cool. And then you hear these real world people are like, eh, I don't know. But the thing is, it's also early days. And he acknowledged, he said, well, look, we're still having challenges because we still haven't even outfitted all of our rooms. You've got a lot of companies that have, you know, eight-year-old Skype systems in them, for God's yeah, sake, yeah. right? And, and those are being outfitted as people start to return to the office. So I do think, this is a long way to answer to your question, I do think it's an innovation. I think it's a sellable innovation. So it is a business. You believe I, I it's a business it's, long term. I absolutely term. think it's a business. And what's particularly good is because Cisco is unique in that their interoperability with all the other platforms is way better you know, than any of the other guys. They recognize that, look, maybe you guys are a WebEx shop, maybe I'm a, a team shop, whatever, but the point is, even with that, if I have to do a call with you, we're going to use one platform or the other that one of us doesn't have. So you ha we live in a world where you're going to have all of that, and Cisco spent a lot of time and effort, again, doing that work and they're continuing that work. What's your focus on research? Take a minute to explain to the audience what your research areas are. Yeah. Obviously telecom, Cisco, devices. Yes. What's the focus, Apple. Edge? What's yeah. your main focus? Yeah, well, it's, it's, it's hard to describe because I do a lot. Um, but you know, my background, I've been an industry analyst for almost 25 years now. Um, and I was at IDC for a long time. And at IDC, I ran, uh, right after you left. Yeah, Dave, it was the same uh, year, yep. uh, yeah. Um, I ran. The I left that place in good shape. Didn't yeah, I? you did. You did. <laughs> uh, yeah. I ran the devices research, so all the PCs, tablets, smartphones, displays, uh, and then I ended up doing a lot of semiconductor stuff uh, because of that. And then, you know, as great as as a company like IDC is, and I still have a lot of friends there, you're stovepipes. You become that person. And I saw on the horizon a lot of bigger stories happening. You know. Well, we were heading towards things like 5G was becoming a concept. Edge computing was a concept. IOT sort of stuff. Smart cars, AR and VR. IOT, industrial IOT, yeah, all that all stuff. All of that stuff. And so I felt like there were going to be bigger stories to tell and I wanted to be able to link one thing to another. And that's where oftentimes the bigger firms fall down because they may have somebody who can go way down in the weeds in one area, somebody who else can go way down the weeds in this area, but they can't do that top level connection that yeah. actually is how the real world works. Dave calls them stovepipes too. Yes. And that's John, is a, and John uh, is a dot connector. He's got that superpower. So yeah. that, you know, that, that, you I are mean, too. And, that's, and yeah. so I, I that's a, I'd never yeah. thought of that phrase, but I like it. So uh, maybe I'll steal well, it. It's I'm a dot <laughs> well, I mean, this is the systems mindset. We were talking to all the Cisco executives, which I like about their, the executive leadership team here, is that they get the systems architecture, consequences when you change something, there's consequences. They're all networking guys, even Jonathan Davidson's graph, talking graph databases. These guys are nerds. Yeah, totally. I mean, they like it, and this is like, like they're into it now, Dave. So it's like, and then they're simplifying very Apple-esque in there, that Steve Jobs famous, um, you can see it online where he comes in and takes over. We're going to simplify this, we've got too many products. Yep. We're going to go back to Chaya Day, remember yep. that moment? Yep, yep, yep. That was when Apple was down really low, that was the beginning of their turnaround. And I feel like, not that Cisco's turning around, but the question is, can they get to a trillion? It's very Apple-like to simplify the narrative and then get everyone behind that common mission, which is a system. You got a device, it's connected to a network. Right. Is it secure? What about privacy? Right. Then you're not talking about spectrum, you're not talking about 5G, you're not talking about plumbing. You're talking so, about... But, but so they, and yet they do the plumbing to enable those other things to happen. And, and the thing about Cisco that I think a lot of people don't understand, and, and back to my research, so I've done things on 5G, I've got a study in the field on generative AI, I've done stuff on uh, modern mobile applications. So the thing about Cisco, everybody just thinks, oh, switches, routers, blah, 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 you know, old school Cisco, and obviously they've, they've evolved quite a bit over the years, but 
they are inherently involved with the deliver the creation and the delivery of applications, right? Companies build applications. The nature of how those applications are built these days is, you know, it's distributed. Yeah. And so it happens all over the place, which means it's not like I double click on an executable in the old days and everything just ran, right? Yeah. This stuff happens all over the place and it's making those network connections happen and then monitoring them, oh by the way, thousand eyes, et cetera, et cetera, that is really their key to success moving forward. I want to ask you a question because we just talked about IDC stovepipes and then the, the platforms. Design thinking was a big, oh design thinking was a big part of the UX movement. Now there's a whole movement brewing systems thinking. And remember back in the days, the platform wars? Yep. The sure. internet's the platform. <laughs> it's global. So there has, to, there has to be some platform systems thinking in now as you design, whether it's cloud native apps, you got devices to worry about, form factor, and to me this Apple announcement where it ties together here is that whether it's an endpoint device on the network or a, con, uh, a ski goggle that's in that, the, the spatial end, uh, computing or whatever you want to call it, is now just a consumption layer. Right. So the content's going to change, the connectivity needs are going to change, the kind of policies you might right. want to use AI for, like, oh, high bandwidth needing application right, right. now, or some sort of feature on a, on, a, on, a, on a graphic GPU. Right. This is all like, all like a melting pot. Yeah, no. What's your and, analysis? What's no, your reaction? No, I know, it absolutely is. And, and, and again, it's the inherent complexity, unfortunately, of the way these modern apps are built. You know, yes, it's very flexible, and you've got the CI, CD development process, and again, we've got public cloud and private cloud and hybrid cloud and multi-cloud. So you got all these pieces all over the place, and to get it to function and deliver you the actual service and experience that you want requires all that background plumbing. And that's, again, that's what Cisco has been doing, and it's a super hard story to tell, to be honest. And yes, they are simplifying, and I think they're doing a, a good job. I think they have a long way to go, to be fair, because I think it's just that hard to really do it. So, I think I just named this <coughs> segment. I think I'm going to call it either four, maybe even five things people misunderstand about Cisco. There you go. So we just hit WebEx. That collaboration is not just WebEx. Right. It's not just a Zoom competitor. Uh, or a oh, video conferencing right. app for yeah. Right, 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 okay. The second thing is, it's not just plumbing. It is plumbing, right. but it's yeah. also about supporting the apps, the right. application experience. The third thing came up on Twitter with Keith Townsend. Cisco's not a security company. Cisco absolutely is a security yes. company. And then the fourth and fifth, so silicon chops. Right. You, you know silicon, yes. you and I Let's talk arm. Yes. I want to talk about that, get into it. And the fifth is a maybe, I want to get your guys' opinion on is, you know, Cisco doesn't have a cloud. Which, okay, they don't have a public cloud, but right. they, they, the I, clouds. I, they've got several clouds. So yeah, they are the cloud. we're going to call this five things people misunderstand about Cisco. I, like you guys it. Go? Okay. I think it's good. So let's, let's get into some of the other ones. Um, oh, the other thing is we had a little thought exercise yesterday. Okay. We're playing around with Zeus, I think, and John and I. Can Cisco actually pull a Microsoft with Nadella or an Apple and 5X its valuation, get to a trillion dollar, be a, be a trillion dollar company? Big moonshot. You think about these areas, you think about a company with its brand and its resources, why not? Now, Microsoft it, was around the same valuation 10 years ago, yeah. $26 they a share. They had much, much more profitable, even though Cisco's incredibly profitable, yeah. they had that software, but Apple was irrelevant, right? right? You know that well, yeah. so what do you think about that thought exercise? Um, it's an interesting one. I mean, look, everything is getting connected, and again, they are going to provide some of the hidden plumbing for connected cars. They've talked a little bit about that. There is the plumbing for connected devices and IoT. Now, look, IoT has taken forever and it's not really done what we all thought it was going to do, but it's mm -hmm. getting there. Smart buildings, they're talking a lot about that, right? Um, and all the connectivity and, you know, from a sustainability perspective, from an energy consumption perspective, there's a lot of things they're doing in the background. Um, Obviously, collaboration is going to continue to be a big thing. There's, they've got a lot more competition there. Um, you know, I, 5X could be tough. I'll yeah, be so something's got to happen. There. But, I mean, yeah. but, the, but think, let's th start with the TAM. Connecting everything to make anything possible. Right. Okay, that's a big TAM. Yeah. Okay, so when I think about this, I'm like, okay, they got to execute on their existing business, of course, but then I start thinking about the edge. Right. And that, you and I have talked about this. I remember we were on a call one time and uh, 
both of us jumped on Jeff Clark. Like, yeah. why wouldn't you make your own yeah, silicon exactly. design? The same way? So, but Cisco designs its own silicon. Yes, Maybe a lot do. of people don't realize yes, that. Maybe that's right. I think a lot of people know, but they, for instance, they sell silicon to yes, others as well. Exactly. That's Including hyperscalers. Yeah. Yep. So, so what are your thoughts? And I, I don't know if they're just not talking about it publicly, but well, what are your thoughts on them doing potentially, as we've talked about, an arm at the edge? Right. You know, for AI inferencing and Absolutely. IOT. I mean, that could be very interesting. Obviously, the Silicon One stuff that they've done has primarily been about moving data bits around yeah. and, and you know, across networks and what have you. You know, the other thing we haven't thrown out yet, you know, generative AI. We haven't talked about that and, and the implications that that has on moving a lot of data around. Now, sometimes it's just within the data center, but again, you know, Cisco can drive that. But to your point about the edge, yes, if there is a mechanism by which they can help enable the creation of devices that can do inferencing on the edge, it becomes interesting. And yes, they're an ARM licensee. They could absolutely leverage that. They can also leverage the fact that they are a hugely trusted partner of all the telcos. And the telcos have the physical presence of the edge. Um, you know, there was a lot of, I'm not convinced we're really going to see things in every cell tower as I think at one point some people predicted, myself included to be honest with you, or at least, not predicted, but at least thought was a possibility. Mm -hmm. But they do have that physical presence. And again, Cisco's working with these guys, they've got the silicon to make the connection, they could easily start to think, well, not easily, but they certainly could create some kind of uh, a processing, and is there other kinds of acceleration that they could start to think about for generative AI-based edge workloads, and, or and video streaming, or what have and you. And if you think about just the you know, silicon, and obviously x86 has been a huge success, and now it's you know, under fire. But if you look at what Apple's doing, and Tesla as well, and you take the combination of the CPU, the GPU, the neural processing unit, the accelerators, Moore's Law grows at roughly 40% a year. Right. We're talking about over 100% a year in terms of performance improvement at a way lower cost, getting to tape out in I don't know, what, nine months versus 18 to 36 months. So my point is this, the company that figures this out at the edge could potentially completely alter the economics of computing. Absolutely. Across laptops, devices, data center, you know, other devices, headsets, I, I, and no, so forth. And, and, and right now, I think companies like Cisco look at it and go, eh, no profits in it, just like Intel did when, when Jobs asked them to make a chip for yeah. the iPhone. No, and, and that's fair. I think part of the other challenge, though, and this is what's kept some of the IoT things from happening in a big way, I think it's, it's still a challenge for Edge, is Edge, you know, and the notion of distributed computing is one of these things that from a philosophical and an architectural perspective seems extraordinarily elegant and beautiful. And then when you actually talk to the people ugly. trying to do this stuff, it's like, <laughs> uh, it's a mess. It is really ugly. And it's really hard. And who knows, you know, even being able to determine what level of compute is on this edge versus that edge and what different applications are going to require, there's so much that has to be figured out. And it's not a single company's job to figure that all out. And so I think that it represents a challenge, not only for Cisco, honestly, for all the companies trying to figure out this whole edge idea and the edge And strategy. it's hard to find a horizontal play that's yeah. obvious, yeah. Uh, but, to, but I, I believe- The point about Intel was a good one. They ignored the small form factor. Yeah. They used their lens of profitability into it, which is why I think Cisco, with the new platform strategy, my only open questions coming out of this event will be, what will they do to match the story? Right. If, but if they do, they would then align with you saying, hmm, is the edge a platform? Right. Okay, it is. It's also a device opportunity. So, okay, they want to, if it's yeah, connected, I, it's protected? Really? Uh, and that's fair, but I, the other thing to bear in mind is, let's look at the history of, of Cisco's revenue and profits that was hardware versus software versus services. Right, obviously it used to be all hardware. And now, what's it now, 30% software? I think roughly? it is, I, think, yeah. I, don't, I don't know the exact number, but it's, I think. it's growing quite yeah. a bit, obviously, and, the, and that's the other path toward the billion, is that making that transition so that all of a sudden it's, it's an, instead of an 80-20 hardware, it's an 80-20 software kind of a story. And obviously there's more margin and more profitability in software, so 
maybe that. And I think cross cloud too. You know, we call it super cloud, but but I think that is an opportunity. I, I I think you agree that it's a problem that multi cloud complexity is problematic. Take a networking cross cloud strategy, security cross cloud. Right. You've got your weave of, 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 of observability. Yep. Full stack observability through all that. You know, there's upside there. There's no, I, again, I look at it, their vision, connecting everything to make anything possible. Right. That's like it, endless TAM. No, it's true, and, and again, I think it's, I happen to be looking at an AT&T sign, of course, they had their announcement with AT&T this morning as well, obviously just for small and medium business, but. Unpa unpack that a little bit. Yeah, what, sure, what so they announced the fact that they have a new special arrangement with AT&T, uh, specifically targeted at small and medium business to do WebEx-based calling, so, uh, as they they were describing it, you know, when you had a hard line system in a small business, you're like, hey, transfer it to your phone, whatever. Now that all those phones are mobile, they need a better mechanism to do that. So they're levering WebEx to be able to enable that across multiple devices in a small business. The other thing is you've got small businesses running credit card transactions, what have you, so they need something like SD-WAN. They don't know they need SD-WAN, they just know that they have to run secure transactions. So now, um, you've got this situation because AT&T and Cisco um, you know, have this work together, or uh, they've created this offering, and, but part of the reason why they created it, and I got a chance to talk to John Davidson about this last night, was um, the uh, they have an arrangement because of their IoT-based stuff, uh, and some of the connected car business has been in, uh, for a long time running. So they already have um, the uh, peering arrangements and all this kind of stuff with AT&T, which That's is why asset. they chose to go with them. So, now again, it's it's a different animal, it's not a big enterprise thing, but obviously there are millions and millions of small businesses out there, and some of them are going to need this kind of capability. I think, so. I, think, I think, Dave, that's why I'm, you know, you always say, oh, that the, the profit that Microsoft had. The thing about Microsoft and Cisco that match today in the pattern matching is, and when Microsoft was that low, they had the old dogma, Balmer. Right. Developers, developers, MSN was nothing, they had no real zeros and Windows around. everywhere. Windows everywhere. Yeah. Dot Even net, on the phone. Dot yep. Net developers, <laughs> the whole ecosystem, Visual Studio. So, but they had an install base with Office. Yes. Yes. They, they had the monopoly yep, with right. Windows, and they had all those customers, they had SQL Server, yeah, yep. whatever. Okay, but they were servers, they were powering stuff. The switching costs for the customers to go to Google Docs at that time, right. The only real competitor. Right. Maybe something else might have been out there, but it was basically Google Docs. Not really well, an alternative. Yeah. So Cisco's got this install base. No yes. one's going to rip their routers out. It no. runs their networks. Yeah. So that the customers are there. Right. If they could nurture the base, pull them, bridge to the future strategy, which you saw up there, it's their theme. If they nurture their core networking product people, right. get them platform enabled, get right. them ready, and then just boom, open well, up the kimono. And, and that's again, that's the only path. But there has to be a yeah. flywheel, right? Yeah, but that's yeah. but the, it's kind of it it's going to pop its head. But Gen for AI Microsoft, it was Azure. Yeah. Right. No, it was and for Office Apple. Cash cow. Yeah, yeah. But I'm saying the, the, to get them back to prominence, yeah. it was Azure. They built everything on Azure yeah. with the cloud. They leaned yep. in. And for Apple, it was iPhone. It took how many right. years with Azure? Yeah. Yeah, at least six to get in the game. I'm not saying they're three. going to get to a trillion. No, no, I'm not saying they're ever going to get there. I'm saying what is the path? It could be. It would be a decade. The path right. is what they laid out. I thought the story lays out a path. I can see a trillion dollars in that path. Yeah. I mean, they're security, not talking about this, by the way. This security, is our little security. <laughs> security, four billion, forty. Yeah. Yeah, they yeah. got a 10x yeah. security. They got a 10x security. At just, that's got to happen. Right. Collaboration's what? a wild card because you got the telcos yeah. now. You can OEM that platform. Get out of the WebEx retail game. Yeah. Be a platform. Right. Jump in. You, but you, I was just going to say the edge stuff that you were bringing up, yeah. though. Look, the, the telcos, 5G is not proven to be what we were all led to believe it was going to be. Right, is anybody ever going to make right. money off of 5G exactly. is the joke. Uh, and so they are, they spent a lot of money, especially here in the US, for Spectrum, right? And a lot of countries around the world obviously are just getting these deployments happening. And, and nobody's paying for slightly faster download speeds, which is all you really get right now. So they're hungry, that is the telcos, to figure out an edge strategy, because again, they know they have the physical points of presence that nobody else can touch. So if Cisco can help somehow enable that for them, that I think is well, you know, one of the calling cards for them to drive that. We just started a stealth initiative called the Cube Star. 
It's like the Michelin star for like entertainment venues. Start with Fenway Park, and we're gonna go around the country and we're gonna hit all the venues. All right. Well, we hit the Vegas, of course, watch some sports, Dave. Right. <laughs> a little bit of a viral activity. We did a speed test at the hockey game here. 5G blew away Wi-Fi. Who's running Wi-Fi in the stadium? Cisco. Cisco. Yeah. Their wireless needs work. Yeah, but 5G don't forget, was overpowering. They also, let's not forget that Cisco does do some of the 5G antennas for other environments. It's not just Ericsson, Samsung Networks, Nokia, what have you. But this came up in the analyst, I think you might have brought it up, or another analyst brought it up. No, it was, um, what's his name? Chris Lewis brought this up. Yeah. Chris Lewis asked the question, I was going to ask the same question. What's the 5G relationship with Wi-Fi? Because that should be invisible to the customer. Yeah. Right. Like if you got 5G and it's popping at 25 meg up yeah. and 200 down, right. I'm going yeah. there. You shouldn't have to turn off your Wi-Fi. I, yeah. I did actually ask that question when we were getting a tour of the Cisco Stadium thing. Uh, and they, they, they were like, look, it's a coexistence thing because yeah, yeah. certain it's apps early. are going to run on 5G and certain apps are going to run on Wi-Fi. Now, you know, there was a commentary made that, well, for the Wi-Fi, you have you know, you, you give them your email, 5G, it's all private. So there's yeah. A, <laughs> yeah, this there's other trade-offs involved with some of this stuff, too. This is, this is my point, this is my point, because your 5G analysis is why I'm getting to with 5G. Okay, this is my point about a platform. You don't know what you're going to enable. Platforms should be enabling something. So we don't, what we just thought about was Wi-Fi, they're two different animals. Someone's got to make that work. Right. Is it going to be Cisco or are they going to enable an ecosystem party, which they don't yet have? Right. That is where they make their trillion. They got this, there's got to be a new revenue stream that pops out of nowhere. Right. For Apple, it was the, Mac, it was the store, their commerce, their lock-in, yep. their phones, everything clicked. Now, I'm not saying they're going to do that that level, yeah. but the And I was is, fishing for it with, with something beyond applying AI to your right. existing businesses. I, I don't, I mean, well, I, I don't but, think they figured it out yet. No, but. they haven't, but again, I, I will say, back to, if we're looking for a, a fifth, theme that you wanted to have, um, you know, they, I will say, Cisco has gone gung-ho on the generative AI stuff. Yep. Some of the things they're doing for WebEx, meeting summation stuff, some of that stuff is super cool. And I think people are really going to find that useful. They're also doing some, I think, honestly, I think the first killer app of generative AI in the enterprise is going to be customer service. Because the ability to make any customer service agent or frankly, to get rid of them perhaps, but to, to make the ones that are there all experts because of the intelligence that's built into these tools is going to be amazing. But someone has to help these companies build those. Yeah. And, and so I was asking today, like, hey, who's going to take, so if I'm, you know, UPS and, and I, I need a solution for my, you know, call support line, and I want to leverage the chat GPT general model, but I need to apply the UPS smarts Who's going to be the company that's going to be the teach, teaches these guys how to apply that information to it and then leverages it yeah. through things like the calling agent stuff that Cisco has? I think that is an interesting opportunity that people are still trying to figure out who fits where into that ecosystem and that solution. Yeah, so, I think you're right. I mean, this is exactly the way I see it. Hey, look, at, look, at, look at Amazon, maybe another metaphor or comparable. Um, Amazon's EC2 <laughs> drives their business, okay? That's compute storage, queuing, the rest, right. and then higher level services. What Amazon did out of the gate, which set them up where they are now is, they didn't focus on the apps. Right. They enabled app developers. Yes. Now they have apps, they have call center, they got a connect that, yep. uh, that's doing well. So I can see Amazon prefabbing some apps right. for SaaS consumption, no problem. Yeah. But their core is not to compete with their ecosystem to a degree. Some will debate that. I mean, Snowflake is yeah. competing with Redshift, we know that. Azure, Microsoft, on the other hand, and Google have a massive suite. Right. Does Cisco go down that route? Because go down, what you're saying is like, I can see a revenue model where they flip to network as a service and get the law of small numbers right. in the aggregate. Right. So if I build the killer app on network and they're taking pennies on my dollar, right. that's a channel. Right. No, it's true. It's, I mean, there's a lot of different ways some of this stuff could go, but I don't know if you guys wanted to get back to the Apple thing uh, at all on the yeah, headset. Yeah, before we do, let me, just, yeah. let me just close out of this one. So I got to wait for them to get to 100 billion. They're 58 billion now on a run rate okay. basis. Take networking, which is a $30 billion business, double it, or pick a time horizon, get them to 60 billion. You take their internet business, you know, they call it internet of the future. It's like five billion now. You know, can you get that to 15 maybe? 3X collab and security, if you can 3X that, gets to 12 and 12. That gets them over 100. Are they going to get a 10x 
revenue multiple? No. no. Could they get five to six? So that gets them five to six hundred yeah. billion, and now all of a sudden, who knows what the market's going to do? But if there's some additive piece of right. this that comes out of generative AI that could give them another two, yeah. three, four hundred billion dollars in value, it gets to a trillion. You, right. you could collapse Internet of the Future with end-to-end -end security, it, yes. that's one unit, right. yes. and collapse optimized application experience with collaboration. Right. And you have an app team and you got basically right. Internet. Yeah, and so then there you, you got go. network. So I could see it getting to half a trillion. You know, I think there's a real path to that. The question is that you know. Cisco, Cisco's just now thinking, John and Dave brought this up, they're just now thinking about synergies. You know, J2 Patel brought it up, he's like, and that's the he saw wheel. synergies that he didn't see in the security thing he saw. So the question is, can they have their mind open for synergies and then be agile in their team formation yeah. saying, hey, you know what? Let's put end-to-end -end security with internet for the future. Boom. Right. Well, and they are, I mean, look, they're already starting to combine, and this came up today, this notion of, security and observability are all, both going to leverage the same set of data. So they've got this data from monitoring the network stuff. They can leverage that both for security purposes as well as observability purposes. So that's a twofer that yeah. they can leverage into. So, well, so, so the reason no, I go no, hold on, this. Here's that point there. So, uh, so observability is critical because that also touches software supply chain. You can't have S-bombs Software visible materials without observability data merged yes. in. We oh, reported that. I think that. observability, I mean, it's not sexy, but it's so it's incredibly so important. It's So the reason I go through all this crazy math is because we've got a lot of investors in the audience, as you know. Yeah, Wall Street. And, and even though we don't you know, necessarily give advice, we like to opine or you know, pause it. And I think that my take on this is I think they're going to be conservative. I think they'll do stock buybacks yep. and dividends and they'll just keep going incremental and bumping it up, maybe gets to 200, 300, you know, maybe 400 billion. But unless there's a radical change in how they allocate capital and R&D, yeah. I, I don't see them yeah. getting there. But, yeah. I, I, but, yeah. but, this, but the reason but I bring it up to? is I mean, this company, well, you're right, they don't have to, which is why I think they won't. But from an investor standpoint, it's not like, you look at NVIDIA, That's, yeah. they're not the next NVIDIA, right. at least no. currently, but well, based potentially on the, on the, on something could come out of Liz's yeah. out, out Outpost, what is it? Out, <laughs> out, 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 shift. shift, out, shift group. They renamed the incubation group. Out, shift, uh, emerging. I can, I can never think of them. But something could potentially come out of that. That could be rocket ship. And yes, I do want to get back to Apple. Yeah. So, um, so the device. I mean, one of the things that they show, and in fact, ironically, what was kind of interesting about Apple is the first few applications they showed for Vision Pro were actually business oriented. They were collaboration. Like right. Apple never does that, right. right? I mean, yes, they will show some business apps, but it's always like, oh, and by the way, you know, here's all the cool, sexy consumer stuff, and oh, by the way, you can do this. They actually started yeah. with some of the collaboration stuff. Versus which Facebook. Is, yeah, which starting is. Starting with the cartoons. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. <laughs> I mean, I think Tim Cook and a lot of people are like saying, don't call it the metaverse. Well, of course not. You watch, don't leave. Yeah, Meta, no. Meta's failing miserably with that yeah. positioning. No, but. Be but, spatial computing versus yeah. metaverse. Yeah. A lot of nuances. Yeah. There are a lot of nuances, but look, here's the deal. I did have the opportunity. I was at the event, got to see it, and I actually got to try it. All right, I spent, I, you've seen the reports from another other press and analyst who's, who saw it. Look, it's still a big honking thing on your face. Can There's you really look out the side and no, see somebody? You, no, 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 no. I mean, no. Because that's what they're it, saying, right? They're it has pass through, which means yeah. you're looking through it, okay. but there's a camera feeding what you're seeing. So it's as if, you're looking through it's it. You're not. It's obstructive, you're saying. It's, it's yeah. obstructive. Yeah. And the reason why they did that funky set of eyes on the front with a display is to make it appear as if it was clear. It's not clear. There's all kinds of electronics from the front to the back. It's jam-packed. Um, and it's, you know, it's only about a pound or so. But again, you're sticking this thing on your head. You're, you've got a thing around the back of your head, another strap across the top. Um, and you know when you first put it on, the uh, you know you have to look at your eyes. Look, you know it's like being in the at the uh, optometrist. They're like follow the dot, you know, and that's how they track the eye tracking. So you've got to set it up. Um, there's a fair amount of work involved to get that done. But then you can actually see around, and so and you can dial in and out the amount of screen. So you have a giant screen if you want. You can have a in a in a weird way. At the end of the day, Vision Pro is a massive monitor. It's a massive virtual monitor to show whatever you want. Will it ever be like my sunglasses that I, I ride I mean, with? I, the, the hopefully, because it, here's, you know, 
I did some research years ago. I mentioned I do, I do research. That's part of what I do that's a little bit different than some other folks. Um, and I did a study on AR and VR headsets. Now, admittedly, this was older generation stuff. But what I found was the average session time that people would have with these devices was like 38 minutes or 40, 39, something like that, right around 40 minute mark. Because it's just kind of overwhelming. And even the Apple thing, it's, I mean, the screen is incredible. It's a face Two computer. Two 4K it's displays. It's a face computer. It's a face <laughs> computer. You're absolutely right. That's great. And, and, and the problem is, it gets, it just gets a little overwhelming. And they did a great job. They have this new custom chip called the R1 that's designed to take all the sensors and avoid delays because other headsets, if you would move, you'd get this weird delay and that would contribute to motion sickness. Apple seems to have done a pretty good job. But when they started showing these immersive videos where you're standing on a mountaintop looking straight down or whatever, it's still like, it's a little much, you know? Yeah, yeah. And I, I, I describe it as, it's hyper-realistic. Yeah. And your brain can only handle so much visual information before you're like, oh, no, no. Uncle. Yeah, <laughs> and so, I mean, again, They've, they've thought about this. Remember that, remember that meme where Mark Zuckerberg's walking down the alley and everyone's got the, the goggles on? How, it was a That's, Samsung yeah. event. I was at that okay. event when that happened. So the, the, what was going on around the internet was Tim Cook would not be seen wearing one yeah. and the Bloomberg reporter wrote, and you know, I got massive tweets on my comment, why isn't Tim Cook wearing one? I go, avoiding the meme explosion. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because everyone would take it. Yeah. Can you imagine oh, if Tim Cook put one of those on? Because he didn't he didn't put one on. Well, yeah. but then you wonder what the unintended consequences of having this face computer right. on all the time. You remember the movie Steve Martin, the I think it was called The Jerk? Yeah. And he and he the guy invented OptiGrab. Oh yes. And then it went bust <laughs> because everybody who used it went cross-eyed. That was yes. the unintended consequence. So you know, your brain's I mean, gonna be. Here's the thing, you know, I, I'm saying all these things You're in a these things. You want to watch a movie, maybe. Yeah. But of course, as long as it's <laughs> yeah. not more than two hours, because otherwise your battery will run out. Um, which is, you know, price wired. Is, That's price is too high. Too. Price is high. Grand, all in. The thing is, yeah, but those for developers, right? Right. I mean, it that's is. And 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 let's not forget the number of people who misjudged Apple on several other products is enormous. It's almost you can't write Apple off because it's Apple, and they know what they're doing. They're not idiots, right? It does feel, maybe, like in this case though, that it's going to be a lot tougher because I do think the experience is, is something that's more of a gimmick. It's super cool. Like the first time you try it. For me, it's the, it's the goggles well, factor. I mean, I mean, I will it be, a, the question is for, again, to come back to investors, will it be a meaningful part of their business? You think of the, the Apple of Watch? Not. No, but it's I mean, not the, but, a, but, yeah. but think of the Apple Watch. Is that, I mean, what percent of their business is Apple Watch? Probably what, 5% well, or something? Well, now it's decent, but. Okay, but if the first Apple Watch, it was like, eh. Yeah, but even okay, then. Okay, but Apple Watch is a main category they player. They sold six or seven million, I think, of yeah. Apple Watches the first year. Yeah. They sold like 10 or 11 of the first iPhones. They sold, you know, a lot, many millions of those. Yeah. I said on theCUBE, I would never put a toothbrush in my ear, <laughs> hanging from my ear. Yeah. And guess what? Yeah. I fucking... Exactly. <laughs> I, 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 I've eaten crow on that many times. Well, and that's the thing, and a lot great, of people... It got better. I mean, this is the current version. Yeah. They're awesome. Yeah, and a lot of people have eaten crow on, on, on misjudging Apple. So, you know, take everything I say with a certain grain of salt because, that, but you know, I've been following the, the company very closely for a long time, um, and I, I, th I think I have a sense of the, their sort of gestalt and the way they think about things, and I see where they're coming from. I do, you know, at the end of the day, I, I where does this go it, next? Obviously, the form factor is going to be worked on. Well, you but can it, imagine it's going to take a while. But I, I, at the end of the day, I call it the best implementation and the best technology for a category that nobody wants. Um, and that's that's the issue. It's like it's amazingly engineered. All kinds of thought and detail went into it. But I'm just again, you can't Apple? get when, past that thing. It's a Bob, thing on my face. When was the last big Apple product that was revolutionary or impactful? iPhone was obvious. Obvious. What product? Well, I mean, uh, iPad. iPad was a big deal. iPad, iPad was a yeah. huge deal. So the the, the, the watch iPad. was a big deal. Uh, you know, they, but I mean, again, they've had a few, I mean, how many people have HomePods? Not too many, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, there are things that Apple's done that have not proven to be that big of a deal. Uh, their smart home stuff in general never went anywhere. Uh, they really never Kinda quite pulled that, that yeah. one off. Yeah, yeah. Part of it was because they were charging everybody, <coughs> excuse me, 
to license their protocols to, but, um, so we'll see. It's not like Apple hasn't had a few missteps along the way. They have. This is just a super high profile thing. And so, but to your point, uh, they're going to, obviously they're going to reduce the, the physical size. They're going to cut down the, the resolution of the displays. They'll probably lose that front display for certain other applications. They'll yeah. do a number of things, I think, to get it down, but, you One know. thing Apple doesn't get enough props for is security. I mean, their security's damn. Oh, they're yeah. starting to market that. Their security's yeah, yeah. damn. All right, hey, let's bring it back to Cisco. Yes. Um, <laughs> it's good, it's a good segment. <laughs> What do we want to see? Okay, so we saw these announcements, we saw the, you know, the, the networking cloud, the security cloud, a lot of innovations in collaboration, full stack observability, stretching across the whole portfolio. Uh, very few hardware announcements, so a firewall yeah, announcement, yeah. But, but that's about it. What do we want to see next year at Cisco Live? I'll go first, I'll let Bob close yeah. out. So I think um, what I want to see is, I want to see them have the sizzle and the steak. I want to see, I love the positioning, I love, and I see a path to a trillion dollars, making some assumptions that something will pop out there, but generally the bones are there to a trillion, if they can, if things pop, if they don't get siloed, if they don't get too dogmatic, stay open as a platform company would do, I think it's a trillion dollars. Get the steak from the sizzle, and then, and then they got to just deliver and execute, right? They got to execute, and they got to have their eyes open for that next corner. They got to be, because platforms put you in a position and they install base if they just listen to their customers and get in and nurture them, secure them, listen to them and build with them, they can invent stuff and I think that's key. And finally, I'd like to see them get a developer ecosystem and a partner ecosystem that's actually producing game-changing products. To me, that would be like a killer mission statement and keep bringing the goods. More announcements that's shipping, not vapor. Deliver and they're going to do good. They deliver on what they did, Dave. They will, now Jesus, we're delivering, but like, like there's a lot of stuff yeah. under the covers. Yeah. SD-WAN stuff, a lot yep. of plumbing. It's not that easy to make magic. No, it's not. And you know, look. What's your take? I, my, my take is that I would love to see them continue to focus on improving the overall experience of delivering applications. And they started with this customer deliver, you know, application delivery management stuff that, you know, I think that's going to be important. But I want to see them go beyond the simplification to even productize some things to make it easy. Again, why shouldn't I get a complete uh, call center solution with built-in generative AI training tools that I can hand to a company, they install it, it, it sucks in all their data, and it all of a sudden creates these amazing uh, you know, call center stuff. Again, they hinted at that with the call center agent things. I would love to see more of that. And then I'd love to see them do something with the carriers around the edge. And it and, and might come in several different forms. There might be some hardware. But certainly there's going to be some services and some things that the carriers can leverage their physical points of presence and do additional things that Cisco is enabling. So I'd like to see more of those kind of finished or nearly finished solutions. I think you guys made some excellent points and, and I agree with the developer piece in particular on top of the platforms and I really like what you said about the edge. I would add, I'd love to see more ecosystem action around the edge. Yeah. That's something I want to see. And I think I want to see you know, com some consistent predictable growth out of the company. I think, I think their long-term growth, I think it's either six or nine percent, I can't remember. I'd like to see that. I'd like to see collaboration get back to growth now that it's a platform. Same thing with security. I'd like to see double-digit growth, like not just 10%. I'd like to see 20% growth there and see that trajectory that's consistent. And that's what, that's what I'll be looking for, at least the starting point a year from now. All right, John, awesome. Great job, Dave. Bob, thank you so much for Absolutely. coming on. Thanks, thanks this for having is, me, guys. This is a wrap, uh, our, our, our last day here. We're, we're cutting out. Now listen, go to siliconangle.com. We got all the news there. Thecube.net is where we keep all the, all the videos. Big month coming up, right? We're I'm in Anaheim next week. We've got, gosh, we, let's see. We got HPE, you're at Mongo. We got uh, Snowflake. We're going to be at Databricks. We got SuperCloud coming up in mid-July. So. Check all the action out. This is Dave Vellante for John Furrier and our guest, Bob O'Donnell. Thanks for watching, everybody. We'll see you next time on theCUBE.